My name is Scott. Oh Harris. my gosh. <laughs> Just listen. No, no, no. <laughs> Oh wow. There's no background noise. Yes, there was, and that was fine. Oh, okay. It happens to be all the time. Oh.
That's beautiful. You know, it's um, it's uh, it's a it's a classic. <laughs> it's a classic arrangement you did. Really beautiful. Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry about the background noise. I don't hear it. Uh, maybe our listeners can tell us if you hear any background noise, and if so, then you know we'll have to deal with it. But I don't hear anything. Yeah, when you were playing the the, the uh, video, it was happening, and then now it's gone. And as soon as you turned down the wine, it was down. Oh. Who knows? The Zoom maniacs are out to get it. <laughs> I don't know. I'm so tired of technology. I mean, I love tech. We all feel the same, I'm sure. Love it and hate it, you know? <laughs> it's what we need just to survive. And yet it's, it, uh, technology, you know, to be fair, has had to advance so quickly to deal <laughs> with the craziness that we have. Um, I have some friends who've chosen not to deal with it, and I, I certainly understand that. Um, I've chosen to deal with it because I'm a school teacher and I have to deal with my students. So, I mean, they need me and I need them. So we have to. We have to yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I know it's it's because uh, I speak to some people I ask to be on the show. They they really are. They do not deal at all pretty much with Facebook or the computer, or they don't know how to do Zoom. They don't have a camera on their <laughs> on their computer. It's really interesting because, yeah, you would think that they're, I, but, you know, I mean, everybody has their own level of tolerance, you know. Well, it, it's sort of a generational in that I used to think it was a theory that for every 10 years you are twice as good on the technology. Like people 10 years younger than me are twice as good as I am, people 20 years young. And so my kids that are like 30, 40 years young, they're like 10 times, 12 times better at this stuff than me. Yeah. Doing it in their sleep. Yeah. So if, if I'm gonna teach them, I kinda have to, I, 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 I like to think it keeps you young, um, but I do think that you have to find your own. <laughs> your own comfort level with it like i i can't spend eight hours a day trying to figure out how how a mic works but i i, I probably spend a couple hours a day dealing with it you know i used to, when i was a kid maybe i spent that much time watching tv so maybe two hours a day of media isn't the worst thing in the world I don't know. <laughs> well ladies and gentlemen besides all that this is the fabulous bill cunliffe <laughs> i'm really good yeah we haven't seen each other in a little while yeah. i love i love one i mean zoom you know i live on zoom now one of the great things is getting to see everybody's house and seeing their room and seeing all the stuff they have <laughs> so I'm, I'm beautiful picture of you and your sister back there is that right or actually those are my twin sisters oh yeah they're that the picture i really i really love that's just one of the you know because twins always you always get great pictures of twins you know <laughs> my, mother, my mother was a twin oh yeah. that's cool yeah. yeah i have i love i especially love when they're very young but i have this one in my hallway that's they're probably in their late teens maybe college age and um, my uncle was a photographer and he took he took this session and this one picture came out they were looking sideways and it really looks like they're from a different planet you know <laughs> i mean the two of them you know are from some other planet you know i really like it but um so man uh, by the way some people said they did hear a white a white noise and then some people said they heard nothing um so i don't know what that was it might have been the youtube uh i don't know i'm not sure i mean there's nothing that i've done differently here so but you never know we'll see on the next thing but anyway bill cunliffe so that first of all that was really beautiful and you know great all the great the great players from LA and Tom Warrington was even there. So that this must have been a while ago that that one. Yeah, it sure was. That looks like it was done in that place in Santa Monica. 
Typhoon or no? Uh, the the one where you had to use a password to get in and it was oh before. upstairs. Yeah, do you remember that place? Sure, I played there a lot. Uh, no, the I forgot the name of it though. It was something. I mean, it was Ray, the guy Ray ran. He was a great guy. And do you know that he? Don't he, use he the password. You yeah, know. it was in the big. It was like in a big old house kind of house, and they had actually. Not a restaurant, but they cooked downstairs, and they their their business was you know. A paneled room. I know it was there because George Clavin was the engineer, and uh, he's the guy who actually Residence Records. He put out the record. George Clavin, oh, was there on for your gig? It, well, it looks like he was engineering. That's oh, why video oh, interesting. So good, you know. He did all. He's uh, he was a he's a really interesting guy. He he was the guy. That first kind of bootleg Thad and Mel session from 1966, the live gig, George recorded it on his reel to reel recorder. <laughs> yeah, he's a great engineer and he got that together. And well, wow. Resonance, I don't think, I, I don't hear a lot of people talk about Resonance Records and Resonance Records. Oh my God, he has, he has such a discerning taste and he has so, such amazing things in that catalog. Yeah, a lot, a lot of really amazing uh, reissues he, he's, he's come up with over the last six, seven years. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure how much recording anyone is doing, you know, these days. But, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens. I'm, I predict nothing when uh, yeah. the vaccine gets out there, which uh, I'm, I'm kind of being guardedly optimistic that by fall I'll be back to normal and yeah, uh, living my life. But we'll see. You know, you know. You got to look at the silver linings, but wow, what a tough time for me and for everybody else. And, you know, you feel sorry for yourself sometimes, but then you realize other people, you know, I live in a really nice area of Studio City, but one mile from me, bridge, homeless folks. Oh. Yeah. I, I just, you know, I've, up, I've upped my charity giving, but somehow it never seems to know. I, I feel the exact same. And I think everybody does. I think everybody feels the same. And you can't, you can't, you know, go anywhere without seeing homeless. And it does remind you, it's like, oh, boy, I'm pretty lucky, you know, I have a how home and, you know, um, you know what I mean? Uh, Interesting. Uh, by the way, the place was called the Vic. The Vic, that's right. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. <clears throat> for that's, that's the whole reason the project came out because George said uh, to me, hey, I got all these tapes. They sound really great. Let's put them out on a record. And I said, George, thank you. That's so, I'm, I'm so honored, but I'd really like to do it and do it right, you know? I mean, I don't mind law. I don't mind uh, live recordings. In fact, I, you know, my sextet recording uh, was live from Morocco and I did uh, live uh, my big band was live for Fratello's Bacchanalia. So I love live recording, but I love live recording with some editing because <laughs> um, we had this, at the time, the, the <clears throat> records he had, the recording he had of us was a wonderful, wonderful alto player that I used. That was Bob Shepard. Who, who was yeah, playing. yeah. But the fellow who was on the recording was Zane Musa. Oh, yeah. And Zane Musa, you know. Um, yeah. Just a yeah. wonderful, wonderful player. Yeah. But the recordings, um, the particular recording, uh, Zane took about a eight, nine minute alto solo. I mean, it was, it was a long solo and I really enjoyed it. But sometimes things like that are not suitable for a recording that you put out. Yeah. For people, you know, it's like I was listening to Chick Corea's ARC the other day. Yeah, and you know it's very uncompromising music. A lot of free stuff, um, but the free sections, you know, they go for two, three minutes, and and they're interesting. But then they settle down, and it goes into something else. Yeah, um, it just didn't feel right to me. I wanted to have control. So yeah, we did it in his studio. And of course, George has this Fazioli two hundred thousand dollar grand piano, which is one of the greatest pianos I've ever played. Yeah, and his studio is wonderful. Um, in fact, that's where we did West Side Story. Oh, President's Big Band, yeah. uh, Peterson Project with Marion Petrescu. Uh, we did that there. I mean, it's a great recording studio. So um, that was the right call. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, yeah, I've I've done live recording and also um, that's really tough well, for a singer, <laughs> Kathy, because you're just all out there. And, you know, I always you know, the voice is, is the hardest instrument to do, because like I, I can hit a button here and I sound pretty good. But you you not only you have to know the note, your voice has to work. You've got to remember the lyric. I mean, it's much harder to sing than to do pretty. I think it's the hardest instrument there is. And for a thank you, album. <laughs> thank you. Oh, you know, man. but you know who um, who did it was um, Wayne Pete. Wayne Pete is a it. yeah, he's a pianist with a ah. small recording studio, but he does. Um, who's the guitar player who works or used to work at UCLA? The you know famous older Not guy. Pisano. Sorry, Not John Pisano. No, no, um, no. The real he's. In fact, I think he died. Um, the he was older, black. Malo. No, black. Um, he was at UCLA. He was there for a long time. Um, oh gosh, Kenny Burrell. Kenny Burrell. Yeah. So <clears throat> Wayne did all Kenny Burrell's live albums. Yeah, he's really good, really good. And he, I mean, that the record that I did with him it came out really well i mean i just couldn't believe what he did he was so good at it you know yeah was it with a trio quartet what was it yeah it was with my group called the moment it was gary fukushima on piano and electronic keyboards uh brad dutes on percussion okay. chuck manning on tenor and jeff richmond on guitar Ooh, great that's a great band. yeah jeff richmond i believe he's buddy richie's nephew <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> Jeff Richmond? I think so. No, really? I, if, if, it, if that's true, I've never heard that from him, and I've known him since college. But, I don't really talk about him. Well, I'll oh, I, have, Richmond, but I, I have to ask him that. That's pretty humorous. I think he's related to Buddy. Richmond. <laughs> Rich M.A.M.? I don't know. It well, could be. I don't know. That's hysterical. <laughs> um, Aunt Morrow is here. Hi, Aunt Maro. Wow. He, he's calling you Maestrissimo. Maestrissimo. <laughs> uh, he is Maestrissimo. <laughs> Maestrissimo. He's an unbelievable piano player. Aunt Maro, I, I just, I, lo I, I love him. I love him. He's just ridiculous. He can do everything. And I know. Beautifully. And his wife, she sounds amazing. And their band, they're really, really great. So, yeah. Um, you know. Feliz Navidad. <laughs> they are special. Yeah, so, sure. so William, so are you from the East Coast? Kathy, I'm not the only one losing their memory. Are you from Boston? I'm from Andover. Oh, right. You You're know what? Newton. But we haven't talked about that in so long, and I applaud you for your memory. <laughs> it's not so good in some areas, as my wife will remind me. <laughs> <laughs> Today's our anniversary. Married seven years. Happy anniversary. Well, it's, it's been seven years. Interesting. Yeah, that's really interesting. There's, there's a Stevie Wonder song, right? Seven years of bad love. <laughs> oh, I hope that's she's not watching. That's just a joke. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I now. A joke. How do you get through this unless you... you, you, you <laughs> Humor. I agree with you wholeheartedly. I I'm a glass half full kind of person, so, and I think I you are too, I right? I get. I have to work on it, but not, but that's what I shoot for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's it's you know it's good. I was talking to Bob Moses yesterday, and we. Oh my gosh! What a great musician. I know he's. Tell me what he's up to. He what? There are a series, <laughs> Kathy, and you know this. There are several really really great musicians in boston that just never wanted to leave yeah and i get that uh, i'm sort of surprised that some of them are african-american because boston is has its uh or sort of a racial there's a thing there um richard reed one of my great friends out here who moved i don't know where he is now great bass player he's from boston yeah but like alan dawson who i worked with a bit yeah in boston, 
the greatest, what I call Chitlin Circuit Bossa Nova feel. <laughs> so great. So great. Wallace <laughs> Marble played that way too. Uh, Bill Pierce. Yeah. Blair at Berkeley, one of the great, great tenor players with Art Blakey. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, Ran Blake, the great piano player. Uh, Bob Moses. Um, there are people that they just decided to keep Boston as their home base, I think. Yeah, well, Bob is kind of thinking of moving because he just feels like he's getting too old for the cold, you know. And he he has this mentor who he's worked with or known for 40 years. I don't know if you know him. Um, Tzigi Munoz. I've heard that. I, I don't know him. So he's a guitarist and a percussionist, but he's also like a spiritual leader. And Bob said he knew him for 20 years before he even got into having him as his mentor. But anyway, so Bob, he's really, you know, his, his mind is really into that. And he's still recording and co collaborating with people. And I mean, he must have sent me 20 CDs, you know. Um, and But I, when I was in college, I, I don't know who came first for me. It was either Bob Moses or Weather Report. But, you know, that kind of music was, I was so turned on by. So he's, he's still doing, it's still him. He's doing, he's, he said he's moved on to more, more abstract things. Um, but he, you can hear him everywhere, you know. He's really, he's really an interesting person. You can, you can go back and hear it. I don't think of him as being an electric musician, though, as Weather Report. I think of that being more electric. No, but the the it's it has to do with uh, what he is drawn to rhythmically, uh, like, and I think Weather Report did this too. They it they would have a uh, like a supportive rhythm. Somebody would you know like they'd count it off, and then the melody had no time. And you could just do so. There was there were these intricate, lovely kind of stretching and kneading and stretching, yeah. yeah. And you know space and uh, and in the early days, uh, Bob, especially Bob, de definitely had electric like Weather Report had. Yeah, 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 yeah. Why? Well, uh, yeah, Boston, um, the W E R S, the radio station. Do you remember that? Yes. They had, uh, <laughs> you know, the jazz the growing up was pretty good. I mean, Eric in the evening, and he's still there. Really? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's he's great. He teaches now, and we're we're in touch. Ah. Then there was a fellow named Ron de la Chiesa, Ron of the Church, and he was on WGBH. And I, I remember still him. Hear him all the time on NPR voiceovers. It's so funny. Wow. Because he's toned down the Boston accent a little bit. You know. Yeah. Not really talking quite as much as like anymore, you know. Yeah. <laughs> um, he's kind of got rid of that for his uh, voiceovers, but um, then uh, they had a show called the Fuse Box, uh, W E R S. It was like twelve to two or something. And even though I was an acoustic piano player, and I've always I love fusion. I love good fusion, and I always I tried to play it, and I'm just not part part of me uh, is is not quite. The technology doesn't come to me fast enough to really, you know, there are guys here in LA, for example, Scott Kinsey, and maybe yeah, he's, my favorite piano player that people don't know as much about, Mitch Foreman. Oh, yeah, he's great. I, he's, he's just brilliant. Yeah. In the technology as well. I mean, he's pound for pound. He's one of the great acoustic piano players of all time. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, he's he back when in the before times, he was at the potato all the time, the big potato. Yeah. Which is a mile from me. And yeah, you, you're talking about Mitch Foreman, right? Yeah. 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 Because yeah, yeah. uh, I I actually saw Scott Kinsey um, when they opened up the baked potato a little bit, you know, during yeah. this the last few months. Yeah. I went to see him. <clears throat> it was great. Yeah. And then there's a fellow named Steve Weingard, who was a good friend of mine from Dayton, Ohio, who moved out here after yeah. I. Yeah. Um, I have this kind of second tier Ohio roots because after I graduated from college, I took a job at uh, Central State University uh, outside of Dayton, Ohio. And, um, you know, when you look back on your life, um, that was actually kind of a good time because Dayton was had a jazz scene. 
uh, Cincinnati had a really good jazz scene and Columbus had a good jazz scene and they're all like an hour apart. So if you didn't mind driving, you could get to all these places. And uh, um, a lot of us, I, that's where I met Dave Carpenter, the bass player. He was, oh, there. Yeah. He was from Dayton. Oh. And he got me on Buddy Rich's bass. <laughs> all those videos of uh, Buddy that I'm on, uh, Dave is the bass player. Oh. And uh, oh. so, uh, yeah, uh, a bunch of us moved out from Cincinnati. So that's kind of my second tier home. Uh, I feel, I've I been like, to Cincinnati. I like Cincinnati. It's nice. Well, they, they have great food. Um, it's it's an interesting place because um, it's 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 purple, but it's more red than blue. But I lived in the blue area. Uh -huh. you know, Mike Patterson, the uh, jazz composer, arranger, uh, pianist, who, used yes. to, who lived here for twenty years. He lived. Yeah. He lived in New York for a while, but he's from Cincinnati and he moved back there. And uh, <laughs> the, um, the blue areas of Cincinnati are very blue, but uh, you go across the river into Kentucky and it's another <laughs> animal. Uh <-huh. laughs> actually, I was going to let Mike know. Sometimes he knows anyway, but I'm going to actually send him a message that you're on because, uh, <clears throat> yeah, I was, because you guys... Like oh, we, go way back. We, went to college. we went to Eastman School of Music together. I've known Mike for over four years. <laughs> but he's a, great, he's a great arranger, a great composer, a real, he teaches, you know, at NYU. And of course he does that from Cincinnati now. And, uh, Wait a minute. He didn't move back to Cincinnati, did he? Yeah. When? Uh, fairly recently. He was in New York, uh, Upper West Side. I know. I visited his house last year. Yeah. Yeah, no, this is recent. Or his apartment. But I just, I also talked to him a few months ago on this show. But, I, and, you know, when I was there, he said he was thinking of moving. But, uh, so he actually moved back to Cincinnati. I didn't know that. <clears throat> wow. Well, you could have a huge, huge, beautiful place for about 1200 a month that you can fit your grand piano in there. And, yeah. You know, he's actually, I think, living in the old Baldwin Piano Factory. Which is on wow. it's on Gilbert Avenue, uh, stone's throw from downtown Cincinnati. It's a beautiful old building that they fixed up. And Eden Park, a beautiful, beautiful park, is right down the street. And wow. Mount Adams kind of you can climb up to the top of Mount Adams and have a coffee at the Blind Lemon, which is like a great jazz club. Wow. And I worked there a lot with a singer who lives here now, Daniela Spaniolo. Great. Oh great yeah. Singer. I remember her name. Yeah. She's fantastic. And she uh She's got a new Christmas single out that she wrote with John Chiodini. Oh, really? Yeah, John, you know, he's from Boston as well. well actually, he's from Rhode Island. He's got that Rhode Island. That, that <laughs> accent, that's another different accent. That's a that side by each. Uh, they they pop side by each over there. <laughs> they talk really funny. And, of course, my folks are from uh, Maine and Vermont. I am. Yeah. That's a whole other way. Uh, yep. Yeah. <laughs> got to go up there. <laughs> uh, yeah, with Bert, Bert and I, we go up to the Bangor packet and get us some fish. I up. That's right. you have to stop me. You to stop Did your parents me. actually speak like that? My dad, a little bit, yeah. Uh, my but dad, my, but my, my country cousins in Vermont. I oh, they're all they're still up there. Yeah, and they talk. Uh huh. They talk like that. Wow. Funny accent. It's amazing. It's. I don't think young people talk that way anymore. In fact. Yeah. When you listen to NPR, most uh, the accents of, in particular, young women, yeah, have been uh, changed irrevocably by not really the Valley thing, but by the movie Clueless. You know, huh. because because girls, it's it's Valley, and it's if Valley English. You know the way I can't even do it, but you know the way the way vowels are elongated and consonants <laughs> are. Uh, oh, Young people on the radio, they talk. I got to work on a valley accent. I don't. I can't really do it. But um, <laughs> I, sh I shouldn't waste my time doing that. I have more important. <laughs> well, it's fun to amuse yourself. My dad actually. My mother went to Staley College of the Spoken Word. It was an elocution school, so she spoke really well. But my father had. He definitely had the uh, the A's. You know, like for for, for fork, he would say fork. You know, and that kind that kind of stuff. So, uh, but yeah, yeah. And then, of course, I say the thing that you pull out of a bureau. I say draw. What do you say? 
um, drawer. You say drawer. Now, where'd you come up with that, man? <laughs> well, I, you know, I didn't. It's funny. My my brother had a real strong Boston accent, but I didn't. Huh. Maybe because I grew up in a household where my parents had, my mother has sort of a light Vermont accent. Yeah. My dad's main accent was relatively light. Okay. Um, and, you know, the kids in school, they all had the Boston accent, but I don't, I didn't really, I can do it. I'm pretty good at it, but I, I, I never really had it deeply. No. Did you, did you play piano from when you were very young? I was eight <laughs> and started, uh, you know, we, uh, we had a, we were living in an apartment and my, and it was a big apartment, two bedroom apartment, the top story in the North Andover above these people, the Rigolis, these very nice Italian family. And we rented the, the apartment from them. And the, there was just a piano up there. You know, you uh. kind of got the piano with the apartment because it was too hard to move pianos back then. So <laughs> um, they, um, my mom played that piano and I started messing around with it and she knew I uh, could do it. But then we moved to a, a little house in the Shawsheen Mill neighborhood of Andover, which was kind of a move up, but the house was probably 700 square feet built in 1793. Wow. You can look it up on uh, Zillow, everybody. 84 Poor Street. Oh my God. Andover, Mass. My <laughs> first house, 1793. <laughs> and it, they, there wasn't room for a piano or anything in there. Yeah. But, um, we lived there for about, let's see, from oh, about five years. But then we came into a little bit of money. My, my mother started uh, teaching school. Um, my dad was a, a, an accountant and also a, a salesman. He sold uh, an, an ancient thing called a manual accounting system, which was okay. checks and binders and envelopes and a whole kind of a suite of products for small companies to run their business. Uh, this all went away probably 30 years ago. Yeah. And um, we went to the uh, Steiner Piano Company in Boston in uh, 1963 or so uh -huh. to buy a piano. And of course, I saw that big Steinway over there and <laughs> my parents are like, no, 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 no. <laughs> But the salesman, and I remember his words, yes, you can get the Steinert. The Steinert is a baby Steinway, oh. which is a complete lie. <laughs> Steinert is just a label put on a piano that was made in Alabama somewhere, not, not to put down Alabama. <laughs> so, um, but um, so um, we got a Steinert console upright, which is like one inch bigger than the tiniest, tiniest little spinet piano you could get. And it, it, was, it wasn't very good, but it was good enough for me. So I, I started taking piano lessons in the third grade. Yeah. <laughs> it was good enough for an eight-year-old, right? Yeah. I mean, it, you know, it, it stayed in tune relatively. Uh, uh, we had a, we got it tuned twice a year, like you're supposed to. And I remember <laughs> it was $500, which was a lot of money for, for our family to spend. So they, you know, uh, I was I was grateful for that because my first piano teacher, Mrs. Colt, you know, she was um, she was good. She was a very good teacher, very nice person. And she actually taught me how to improvise a little bit because I would I would just kind of make up things, especially when I hadn't practiced. I would just make up, you know, uh, you know, my friend <laughs> Joey Singer, great no, piano player. I know him. I grew up with him. Yeah, of course. He's from Newton. Yeah. And he li he lives in Vegas now, and of course he worked with uh, Demi Reynolds for years. Yeah, yeah. But Joey uh, was in Indiana, the Jacobs Conservatory of Music, and uh, he <laughs> had he had to do his final jury of um, uh, you know Mozart, and he had practiced. Oh God, Menachem Pressler and these these ancient piano guys were all in the you know up there <laughs> in the gallery and he, he's like playing mozart and he's going you know <laughs> he's 
he just like made up the thing <laughs> in the style of Mozart. And Mr. Pressel is like, that's an outrage. I am shocked. He is, he is just besmirched our music school. But the other guy said, Menachem, you know, he could play. And you know, it really sounded like Mozart. I think we got to give him a pass. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we got his degree from Indiana. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Amazing. Yeah, I love that story. <laughs> Yeah, Joey Singer. Joey Singer was like a year or two younger than me, and he used to play for me and my sister on gigs, you know. Yeah, <laughs> As yeah, a matter yeah. of fact, his, let's see, his aunt, I think, oh, gosh, it's been so long, but his aunt was my mother's best friend since childhood. That's oh. how we were, we were connected. Yeah. <clears throat> I haven't talked to him for a long time. Yeah. So your, your uh, sister is a singer as well. My twin sisters right. were four years older than me, and they had really beautiful voices and very much similar tonality, like you know. The Siegel duo, like the Andrews sisters. Trio, the Siegel trio. But what? yeah, but you know. You said you were in it, of course. Yeah, well, I was, I was, you know, the ham, and I was actually the high voice for a while, and then, of course, my voice. <laughs> like a guy, my voice lowered, but my sisters had really beautiful harmony and one played piano. So we would be, we, that's how we grew up around the piano, you know? You know, I was but, listening to Andrew's sisters last night, which I never, ever do. Yeah. But I'm trying, I'm learning this tune that Clifford Brown did in 1952 on his Clifford Brown in Paris album that no one plays. And it's one of the great songs of all time. I can dream, can't I? I've heard that title. Yeah, oh man. Um... Beautiful. Beautiful song. And Clifford Brown played the heck out of it. Oh. But he left a few, you know, he interpreted the melody a little. So I always go, when I'm trying to learn a tune like that, uh, I'm trying to learn tunes that other people don't do. Yeah. Um, and no one does that tune. And it's, yeah. it's one of the great tunes. Uh, Sammy Khan, you know, give me a C, a bouncy C. You know, he's that guy. And um, he, um, the Andrews sisters, you know, they're closer to the melody. So if you yeah. listen to the Andrews sisters, you can kind of get, you know, uh, how the song actually goes. So then I can, I can do what I want with it because it's a weird melody. It, it kind of goes all over the place. And maybe that's the reason it's not done. Uh, you know, um, it's, it's really weird. It's uh, like yeah, that's interesting. You know who else write, has written some beautiful songs that people don't generally do? Is Julie? By the way, was the sound uh, is the sound working on this? Because I've got sound is mic. well for me the sound is fine. It's very even and it's not cutting out. Yeah, because you've got a nice mic. That's a Blue Yeti mic. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, I like this mic a lot. Yeah, I um I went to Sweetwater because I haven't you know I'm doing all this Zoom. I thought maybe I should get a better microphone. And they said, well. Uh, the Blue Yeti is a good choice, but the Apogee Hype Mic is another good choice. And uh, it's a few more dollars than the Apogee, but it's a crispy present. Uh, it's That's also really got nice. a volume control on it, and you can oh. actually, if you want, use it for uh, audio. You could go headphone out and plug it if you want to do that. But, yeah, you know, so I just did this. That's nice. And did you do know that when your mic is closer to you, your vocal sound is better? Well, that's right. So um, uh, this mic really is that way. Like if I get up, uh, you're listening to NPR. Exactly. That's this mic is too. If I'm far away, you can hear me. But when I get closer, it's really like a nice warm sound, isn't it? Right. Yeah. So here we are. <laughs> Garcia. <laughs> Ooh. Oh, I was just going to tell you that. Um, um, uh, 
who did I say? Um, Jill Stein. You know, I, I found a song that Betty Carter did that was a, a very simple Jill Stein one. Um, let's see. It was on her, uh, that last record. I'd have to go look for it. But um, let me let me go look. You could, you. you um, the, As, who's, who's the singer again? Betty Carter. Oh, wow. Yeah, you know, um, I love Betty Carter. And of course, my good friend, Louis Nash, worked with her for a long time. Yeah. And um, there was a fellow uh, in Dayton, a great piano player. And he's still around, Khalid Moss. And the first term I, the first time I heard um, uh, Betty, Khalid was playing piano. And he's a great piano player. And he's recorded with her as well. And um, so I got to know Khalid in Dayton. Dayton. You know, Cincinnati was the um, uh, one of the hubs of the Underground Railroad. Oh. So there's a huge, wonderful uh, black culture there. A lot of really uh, great black musicians came from there, sort of like the way they came from Pittsburgh and, yeah. to, and to, from a much greater extent, uh, Philadelphia and Detroit. Um, so Cincinnati, Dayton area, um, Snooky Young uh, came from there. Yeah. Uh, you know, um, Kali Moss, but not too many people, not too many of the guys stayed there. Uh, Art Gore, great drummer who played with George Benson for a long time. Uh -huh. He moved to New York, but he moved back to Cincinnati. Um, and Cincinnati has its own problem. It's got race problems too. It, it's, you know, it, it, like I said, it, it's sort of North, but it's sort of South, you know, I'm yeah, yeah. Ohio, the heart of it all. It's, it's a, a fraud and strange place, but the people are really nice, you know, but, I have uh, several friends who live there now, and I've been there. I've taught some workshops there. Um, yeah. yeah, great music school. Uh, yeah, College uh, Conservatory of Music. Uh, Phil, Phil, Phil de Greg. Phil de Greg. Yeah. Uh, Phil de Greg. This is a great book, by the way. Uh, <laughs> I know that book. Yeah. yeah. I have that book. That's yep. A great, it's a great book because it's it's like Johnny Carson or Ed McMahon every every possible voicing you could ever want <laughs> in this book right now you are wrong pentatonic breaths i have another voicing <laughs> i have to, i have to find that i have to find that book and bring it out and look at it right now by the way the song is called this time and it's if you look at the 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 song as it's written it's very it's one of those very simple this time, da 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 do da da, ba da da do da do, da 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 do do. But of course, Betty is like slow bossa nova, you know. This time, <laughs> it's really fun. But there's another song that a fan of mine turned me on to that Julie wrote. That's like, it's it's no more than sixteen bars long, and it's it's a really beautiful song, and it's. I'll have to I'll have to send it to you because it's um it once I remembered the song because it's very it's one of those songs that was written I just call them little jewels you know mm -hmm. it's just really beautiful it's very short and it's but it's just it's a beautiful song mm -hmm. yeah I'll have to re I'll have to think of what that is um so um when did you first decide that you wanted to get go into arranging well, you know, it was it was kind of uh, it was interesting. I um, I was mostly uh, it, it, it was kind of a weird thing, you know. You know, uh, Kathy, you, you have those things where all of a sudden your world kind of lights up. Yeah, yeah. And you know, I remember the first time that the world lit up for me. I was. Uh, 20 years old and I was playing piano, a rock piano. Uh, you know, in, in the old days, you'd have like guitar, piano and drums. Yeah. Like the club date, in New England, probably everywhere, probably New York too. Yeah. Uh, I was playing at the Prince Spaghetti House Route 1 in Saugus. Still <laughs> there. Oh, the Birdie family. <laughs> really good pizza and a comedy club next door. <laughs> uh, and, uh, um, I was playing there with a very good singer named uh, Matt Zychik, who is now a, um, he's from Rhode Island. He's, he's a psychologist, oh. but his brother 
uh, Michael Zychik. Yeah. He still, he still lives in Boston. He's a great, great piano player. Played with the James Cotton Blues Band. He's like a real, you know. <laughs> You know, he was great at that and he could sing as well. And he would always do this James Cotton tune, flip, flop and fly. <laughs> and he would come in and play uh, for me and, uh, you know, just tear the house down. It was, it was so wow. And uh, he said, uh, uh, Billy, uh, you ever heard of uh, Austin Peterson? <laughs> I said, no, I never heard of him. He said, well, I got a record for you. Check this out. And he gave me this record called Tristeza on Piano. No. Oh. And it's actually my favorite Oscar Peterson trio. Wow. Uh, uh, not the one. And I, you know, Ray Brown is probably my favorite bass player, but yeah. this was Sam Jones and Bobby Durham. And mm -hmm. the reason, and, and the first tune, Tristeza, what does it go? <laughs> Oh my God. Chord notes like that. And yeah. I heard this as a, like a 19 year old kid. And I was like, Oh, this is it. This <laughs> is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. So I had that one. <laughs> then, you know, my parents were not musical, but well, my mother was pretty musical. She was a very good piano player. Uh, I forgot about that, but my dad, he just played the phonograph, but he listened to the Boston pops every night, Sunday night on that WGBH radio with uh, who was the guy? Uh, that was um, a great voice. Yeah, Ron. Ron, no, wasn't. I was uh, Ron. No, no um, William Pierce with the Boston Pops Orchestra, Arthur <laughs> Needler conductor. Back in the day, um, all the old white announcer guys had fake English accents, uh, especially in New England. Yes, in New England. And uh, William Pierce. Uh, the the Pops um, concerts were in thirds. Because the Boston Pops, it's a very unusual thing. They they actually serve you dinner and drinks, uh, and symphony orchestra. It's a fantastic thing, and I, I I've seen probably twenty concerts at Symphony Hall where they do this. Huh. I don't know whether they still do it or whether they did that, you know, uh, in the in the recent before times. Yeah. But um, you know, they they played. Uh, Arthur Fiedler was a great great conductor and a good musician, but also a very good businessman and. Uh, he, he was the first, uh, as I recall, maybe the first major symphony orchestra to, to commission people like uh, Dick Heyman to write, uh, I want to hold your hand, uh, Beatles arrangements. For yeah. Austin Pops. You ever heard of the guy, Leroy Anderson? No. He, he wrote this, he was a Harvard man and uh, Arthur Fiedler commissioned him to write music. And one of the, pieces that he wrote was called the typewriter and uh, Arthur Fiedler would not conduct Arthur Fiedler would sit there with an actual typewriter <laughs> and type to this and then Arthur Fiedler would go and do the carriage return <laughs> and it was this kind of you know, corny tune, but Leroy Anderson wrote a lot of good music. He wrote um, uh, Blue Tango. Oh, then there's a, a, a the Tick Tock Clock song. Right. And then he wrote the trumpeters low. I think he wrote one of these, uh, either. I think he wrote that, but then I think he wrote this with the three trumpets. You know, the, the uh, uh, holiday for trumpets. Liz Finch says syncopated clock. Syncopated clock. Thank you, Liz. I knew someone would. The audiences here in LA are great. I knew they would. Come and up. Michael Patterson is here, and he said sleigh ride, the tape, the typewriter. He mentioned yeah. sleigh ride. Oh, he wrote sleigh ride too, which is a really cool tune. 
Ah. Bridge. It's got that bridge that goes. It's in the key of G, and then the bridge goes to B major, and uh, you know, blah blah blah. It's really it's great. And Liz also says fiddle faddle and bugler's holiday. Yeah. So Leroy Anderson, uh, Arthur Fiedler did this whole thing. And so I listened to this stuff every week with my dad. <laughs> and so I learned about all this great music. I mean, from the most popular stuff to the really great. I mean, he, he had like Earl Wilde come in, who's one of the greatest list piano players played spectacularly died like at the age of 90 oh, I know. Yeah. um or wild he would play like rhapsody in blue concerto in f gershwin uh the tchaikovsky the schumann piano concerto all the real beautiful wonderful piano concertos and i was driving in my car on the on the 101 freeway in la i had moved here maybe two or three years after I moved in, it was around 1992. Yeah. And I heard this on KUSC. <laughs> the Rachmaninoff second piano concerto. Wow. And the same thing happened to me. I started crying uncontrollably in the car. <coughs> I, I, I was crying. <coughs> and I said to myself, I have missed a big thing in my life that needs to be there. So I, I said on a, I went on a pursuit of how can I deal with the orchestra in my life? Um, and I actually wrote a whole three movement romantic piano concerto and, and got it recorded sort of in that style. Um, I'm, I'm not putting it out there because I sent it out to this one guy and he goes, man, that's like Rachmaninoff 2.5 concerto. And it was really way too derivative. It, it wasn't like an individual voice or anything. Um, it's, it sounded too much like Rachmaninoff. So it's, I'm, I'm bur that's buried in my archive. It, it probably won't see the light of day. But, um, uh, but then I thought, well, maybe I can start to do arranging. So I, I kind of learned about big band and I've always loved big band and the orchestra and learning about that. And so that's how, kind of how I got into it. And then I, I was just asking people, Hey, you know, I'd love to arrange stuff for you and blah, blah, blah. But when I was on Buddy Rich's band, I did arrange a bunch of music for him. I don't know, but it, I, 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 it kind of went away and then the desire came back. Uh, Dave, Dave Lieb said Loeb, sorry, Dave. Dave Loeb, <laughs> I don't say your name enough. He said, yeah, it's too bad you don't remember a bunch of tunes. Merry Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> he knows more tunes than me. He's, he's actually, <laughs> in some ways, he's, what Dave Loeb is, is like four of me. He's so capable in everything he does. Oh. He run, he's a great, great teacher of jazz at the University of uh, Nevada, Las Vegas. He runs the jazz department there. He's spectacular there. He can sight read anything. He can play anything. He's a great jazz player. Um, he still comes into LA to do Family Guy uh, TV shows. You know, so I wow, did. wow, Dave, what a great guy, just fantastic. And Mikey says the that's a great piece, Rachmaninoff cloned, but brilliant. Well, yeah. um, then I then I that I kind of got into you know the Rock Three and Four, <laughs> and then that branched off into other symphonic music and then I was off and I've, I've always, I've, I've done, you know, I, I actually, um, I did write a, a second piano concerto that was nominated for a Grammy in uh, oh. 2012, I think. Oh, wow. Yeah. And it's, it's more who I am. It's, it's, but it's, it's sort of a tribute to Mozart, but put through a meat grinder, you know, it's got, it's got a lot of jazz in it. You can, you can hear it. Anyone can just, you know, I, I never give people websites anymore. You just go on the internet and type stuff in. You'll, you'll, what, find is, what is it called? Uh, it's a good question. Uh, introduction, something in Rondo for piano and orchestra, Temple University Orchestra recorded it. I forgot, I forgot the name of it because I had a name and they made me change it. Oh, I see. And I, you know, it's one of those things where I had to please. Yeah. I mean, I totally forgot what the name of it is, but, 
uh, it, it was a fun piece to write. And intro, what was it? Uh, introduction, introduction, minuet and rondo for uh, because it, it was really based on like I, I know Prokofiev wrote a classical symphony, so I I thought you know Mozart, you know the piano concerto of Mozart in in a way is kind of the perfect the perfect balance, uh, the the Apollonian balance of the competing elements of the piano and the orchestra. <laughs> spectacular. I love people. Talk about you should do a radio show. Uh, no, yeah, quite, I, I'm interested in making more money than I am now. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> so true. Yeah, Dave, no, by the way, know. Dave said, <clears throat> I don't deserve all that, but I love your rock music. That's the con concerto auto played with the Long Beach Orchestra. Oh. Uh, Otto Ealing is a great piano player that graduated from uh, uh, University of Nevada, Las Vegas. I mean, there are there are kids now that graduate that can do everything. You know, there are, uh, that can play jazz, that can play classical. You know, that's kind of a an exciting new thing that's kind of happened as the genres have become combined. Um, oh yeah, yeah. Um, I agree. I think that's really an interesting thing that's happened over the last. 10 years, 15 years, something like that. Yeah. And there are, there are people like uh, Jean-Yves Thibaudet, who is very much into jazz. And, you know, um, the, thing, the, the guy that really kind of, well, of course, I think the first guy to really, really, really do that was George Gershwin. Uh -huh. and, yeah. Um, uh, with the, uh, the Rhapsody in Blue. But yeah. the other guy that really did it as well <laughs> as anyone was Lenny Bernstein. Yeah, <laughs> who's from my hometown, Lawrence, Lenny? Really, Lawrence, Lawrence, Massachusetts. No, um, of course. I always say the the smart thing that Lenny did was he moved out immediately. <laughs> Lawrence is a, a a beautiful old mill town that has had hard times. It's it's a it's a it's a really it's a tough tough place. It's like Lynn, Mass, but even worse. Yeah, um, but it's a beautiful uh, some beautiful architecture in in Lawrence, and Lenny Bernstein's from there. Uh, yeah, and uh, you know his um, that piano concerto that he wrote, "The Age of Anxiety." Oh, oh, that is a great piece of music. Wow! And of course, West Side Story. What? How can you? How can you? Yeah, yeah, if yeah. If he'd yeah. only done that, he would be considered maybe yeah. along with Gershwin the greatest American composer. And that was just composing. Forget he was a spectacular piano player, and he could play anything he wrote. And his his piano music is really, really difficult. Huh. I was in Germany uh, a number of years ago doing a uh, uh, Gershwin, Porgy, and Best concert with uh, the classical singer Barbara Hendricks. Uh -huh. And yeah. um, uh, the orchestra uh, manager came up to me. Uh, it was with a, a small orchestra. <coughs> I it. Not, not Berlin, but one of the smaller ones. And he said, oh, you know, our, our piano player has left. You have to play this now. <laughs> and I looked at it, and it was the symphonic variations on West Side Story. Oh, my and God. The piano part is fiendishly difficult. And, I mean, I play classical music reasonably well, but I'm not up to doing that thing. I was like, I can't play this. He says, well, you're going to have to because he's not here. He has left for the weekend. <laughs> and yeah. I had no nothing to practice on. I only had a recording. Oh, God. And I was in a hotel room. Oh my God. So what I did was I just listened to the thing over and over again and kind of practiced what I could. And then I tried to find the places where the piano was exposed <laughs> in the open. Yeah. And I really practiced those. Yeah. The places where the orchestra is playing, I just kind of left those out. And uh, I hate to, I hate to imagine what it sounded like. I, I don't, I don't think it was that good, but I, I did, <laughs> I did get through it. Okay. <laughs> that, Let's was, see. That, was, that was pretty scary. <laughs> Yeah, really. Um, Frank Griffith, who's a really great sax player from England, who's going to be on next week, he said uh, he also wrote a Serenata, recorded by Sass, and Vic Damone, among others. Oh, uh, you're talking about Leroy Anderson. Yeah. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah. No, he wrote a lot of stuff. He was like a Harvard guy. <clears throat> and uh, he wrote a piano concerto that he withdrew because he, he didn't think it meant met his standards but yeah i think somehow they have re-released it so it, it's yeah awful. hey um, you know speaking of <clears throat> 
Speaking of the writers, I I just happened to look up Julie Stein because I wanted to remember what song that was. Which I'm, I'm plugging in my computer. It's it's uh, Zoom seems to really take the memory up. So um, continue. Pretend I'm not here. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, I was um, I was going to tell you that that song that I was talking about that the Julie Stein that simple Julie Stein thing was called. Uh, dance only with me really like I think 16 bars very beautiful but then I happened to look up Julie Stein he he wrote a lot of amazing beautiful things he wrote you know well I can just share it with you but you know look, look at this look at what he wrote he wrote uh all of these don't rain on wow. my parade diamonds are a girl's best friend everything's coming up roses I mean, these are, guess I'll hang my tears out to dry. Uh, I fall in love too easily. Pico uh, and Sepulveda, of course, uh, an immortal classic. Yeah, and just in time, I mean, of course. That was, that was a joke. <laughs> uh, three coins and a fountain, yeah, a lot of stuff. A lot of Judy Garland things. Yeah, the party's over, people. I oh, mean. He's an, he's an underrated song. He, the, things, the things we did last summer. Well, oh, that's that's a great song. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. A lot of uh, Frank. Frank did a lot of his music too. Yeah. Did you Did you want me to play anything uh, from YouTube? Um. Gee, I don't know. Uh, I like talking. People can sort of. Um, did you have anything in mind that you wanted to, like? Uh, Oh, it just might be nice to play something that you've arranged, composed, arranged. Um, that's okay. Uh, uh, hey, do uh, do just a little bit of this. Yeah. Um, I think the Goldberg contraption. That's kind of cool, and that it's uh, kind of my take on J.S. Bach. It, that's that's a pretty cool piece. Maybe just uh, yeah, bold contraption. There you go. And you know, maybe just play the first three, four minutes of it, and then okay. fade it out. This cool. is with a. Uh, this is by big band, uh, live at Vitello's, um, uh, Bacchanalia. It's an all-star band, really great band. Uh, as you can see, Bob McChesney is there. I think Kai Palmer, uh, Joe LaBarbera, kind of my favorite drummer, is, is on drums. Uh, Bob Shepard is on uh, saxophone. Uh, Keith Fidmont is on saxophone. Uh, it's, and and uh, we were, this was all recorded live um alex show off did the video and uh it, it it uh it came out pretty well so this is basically my interpretation of the uh, goldberg variations oh cool okay <laughs> Jonathan Richards on the bass. I know him. He's great. Great bass player. I think that's Larry Kuhn's on guitar. Yep. It was beautifully filmed. I think he did a great job. Alex is a, he's really good at this.
Jeff Pennell on trumpet. Okay. Yeah. That's where you wanted me to stop? Sure, that's fine. Okay. <clears throat> that was beautiful. Very beautiful. That's yeah, uh, something different. You know, it, I mean, it's, uh, I, I, I listen back to that and I go, oh my God, you know, the recording sounds a lot better because that's unmixed. You know, the video, we don't have the, uh, you know, the full, the full mixed version. So, uh, but, uh, uh, you know, I, for quite a while, I've been interested in where classical music and jazz meet together because jazz is becoming a, a classical music. And um, so that's, uh, you know, yeah. Kathy, we grew up in a, an era of great pop music. And a lot of the pop music we heard on the radio yeah. was very much tonal. It had harmony and melody and rhythm. And in fact, a lot of the, the pop tunes from the 60s and 70s and actually 50s uh some of them you know came from classical pieces of music yeah um you know um the Bordine string quartet number two you know uh take my hand. it's got that and then it's got uh yeah. you know it's, it sounds like inchworm but it's that, that's yeah another, it's another song i forgot the name yeah um, and then, of course, uh, Eric Carmen did a couple things with the Chopin Prelude. Couldn't be, couldn't it be magic? Uh, couldn't it be magic from the Chopin Prelude in C minor? Then there was a couple of things from Rachmaninoff. All by myself. Uh, and then there was all 
also one from the second symphony. Um, go, never gonna fall in love again. So it goes on and on. I mean, it's uh, yeah. Uh, today, you know, you're not gonna not gonna find Missy Elliott. It's probably not gonna happen. But uh, her music is, you know, it is what it is. It's it's something different. <laughs> Uh, you're getting a bunch of comments. Uh, it's Jordan Richards on bass, right? John Richards. John Richards. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. I'm not seeing the comments. Uh, I I don't know how technology we can. Well, yeah. You you would have to bring up on maybe a different thing, uh, Facebook, and then you could see him because uh, oh, oh, you're where you and I are. Out. Yeah, you and I are on Zoom. So, but I mean. it's it's actually better if I just see the comments because then I then you don't get distracted. And, right. But Mike and Dave are making comments, and and a lot of people are, um, you know, making. Oh, and Ox, this is really nice. Monica Doby Davis, who's a really beautiful singer in town, uh, she said you and your trio at Vibrato was the last performance her dad and she enjoyed together, so it holds oh. a special place in her heart. Oh wow, that's nice. That's always nice to hear, right? It sure is. I mean, it's 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 nice to know that you made an impact, uh, made someone feel good. You know. That yeah. Is, yeah. Thank you. Mark. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's cool. I oh yeah, I mean, I um, I thought people might be interested in how you pick musicians for your bands. Um, you know, I mean, I know how I do it, but just curious, like. Um, you know, there's so, I mean, we have an embarrassment of riches here in LA of yeah. wonderful world-class players. So do you, uh, is it the kind of music that's going to be played or, well, reading of course is probably real crucial and also people with, with a voice, a strong voice like Bob Shepard, you know, <clears throat> is there any other, is there any other way that you think about it? Well, um, those are all part of the decision. Um, gotta be nice people. Gotta be fun to be with, you know, cause ha the hang has to be good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, people who are on the kind of the same page who, who, who really care about this. Cause really, to be honest, you're, there are other, <laughs> there are other ways to make more money doing this. And yeah, you know, LA, because we had such a lucrative studio scene here for so long, um, there are musicians here who are, you know, that's what matters to them. Yeah. And, uh, but the only ones that I want to work with are the ones that care about the music. And actually, to be real honest, most musicians here are here for the music. They really yeah, are. Yeah. Um, I've, I don't find too often that musicians are, are not really supportive of, of what I'm trying to do. And, um, so they've, they've got to, they've got to like it. I mean, there's, I, I do, I do like musicians who are traditional, but also who appreciate newer stuff. Um, uh, I think uh, that's because that's kind of how I am. You know, I love Art Tatum, Fats Waller and all that, but I'm listening to um, Corey Henry and, um, uh, you know, Jeff Keezer and younger than that, uh, Gerald Clayton and uh, all kinds of uh, modern musicians. Yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah, uh, well, let's see. Wendell Kelly says, I love me some Bill. <laughs> oh, Wendell's a great trombone player. We've, we've done quite a few things together. Oh, and Mike is uh, saying that mo the modern jazz quartet seem to have the Bach intimate thing together and big band's always tough. And he says, kudos to you for that. Yeah. What, <laughs> what made the modern jazz quartet work well is that you've got, uh, Milt Jackson, who was a stoned in the wool blues bebop jazz player, yeah, combined with John Lewis, who's sort of an underrated, really, really great piano player, uh, sort of along the lines of Monk. That uh, you could his his solos and his parts are chiseled out of stone. You could write them out, and they're as good as anything you could you could you could compose. Um, <laughs> he's he's very underrated that way, uh, and I think that combination worked really well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Dick Nash is here. Wow. Hi, Dick. <laughs> he 
He said, brilliant Very people with great stories. Yeah, Dick Nash. I've been wanting to find him to get him on this show, too. Boy, does he have some stories to tell? Yeah. Yeah. You know, his um, his son, Ted, I'm a big fan of Ted's because Ted is not only a magnificent um, sax player, but a great band leader and a great composer and arranger. And he had a band called Odeon huh. that I saw a number of times in New York. Uh, featured Wycliffe Gordon on tuba, mm. and uh, I believe it it might have had accordion in it. Mm. And Matt Wilson, I think, played drums. It was a very unusual sounding band, and I, I, I it was thrilling. Yeah. And you know, Ted, of course, we're all trying. We're putting up our, you know, what what am I doing on Facebook? Well, okay, I'll tell you what I'm doing, and blah blah blah. And Ted and Ted has these very well curated, lovely kind of updates on what he's up to, and you know, he's, he's writing, he's writing a book about his dad. That way I think his dad's going to be in the book. And so, I mean, I really want to read this book. Yeah. But then he's talking about wine, the wine he's making. And I'm, i finally, I just had <laughs> to, I had to bust him. I had to go, Ted, come on, leave us something to do. You do everything, you know, <laughs> but I mean, wine making the, my problem is I can't drink anymore. I have a, there's some medical issues, so I'm not drinking anymore. I'm not drinking any less. <laughs> but uh, no, I'm, I'm drinking fake beer, which are really good. And um, I actually uh, did have two ounces of wine the other day. And it, but I'm, I'm, I'm almost not drinking at all. I've, I've had maybe a total of a glass of wine in the last six months. Yeah. Wow. I feel a little better. It's working better for me. And health wise, it's something I need to do. So, uh, now he's making wine and I'm like, geez, he's rubbing it in. You know? <laughs> I want something to be able to do. So, <laughs> like a lot of people, I think I'm, over, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm baking, you know, I, ba I bake bread and I'm baking. Oh, really? All kinds of stuff. Are I'm, you eating at all? Am I eating at all? Yeah. Are you like, if you bake the bread, you oh, and your yeah. wife, do you go through the whole thing? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. There's this, um, there's this no need bread recipe. Uh, look up Mark Bittman on YouTube um, with um, um, the guy's name is Fahey. The uh, Chef Fahey is the um, at Sullivan Street Bakery in New York. And it's easy to make and it's the best bread I've ever had. It's way better than anything you can get at a restaurant. Uh -huh. So Mark Bittman, New York Times, no need, K-N-E-A-D bread recipe. Uh, Mark, is, Mark what's his name? Mark B I T T M A N. He's the food critic at the New York. Oh, Times. yeah, it's the best bread I've ever had, and uh, I'm gonna be making some uh, in the next couple of days for Christmas. Cool. And well, my, then my wife's uh, sister has a really good uh, kind of healthy recipe for chocolate chip cookies, and so we've kind it, of. Is there a healthy res recipe? Well, for absolutely. Them? Well, it's sort of like the double the double tree in recipe, right? You know, the double tree ins have the great chocolate chip cookie. Yeah. But I took that and uh, um, <laughs> whole wheat flour only as opposed to white flour, um, half the sugar, huh. um, a prince of a lot of oats, oatmeal. And instead of all chips, it's half chips and half raisins and a big uh, assortment of uh, walnuts. And they're, they're, they're addictive. I have two or three days. They're they're really really great. Wow, uh, can't go wrong. So ah. uh, I don't have to give you recipes. You go on the internet, and you get anything you want. It's all of them. <laughs> Why you're, you you're so slender. How do you how do you stay slender? Um, well, um, the drinking helped. I've lost about six pounds because of uh, not drinking. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, you know, you know, you hit the. Uh, your seventh decade as Kathy, you will be soon to enter. Uh, yeah, you gotta, you gotta take care of yourself. And uh, it's, um, you know, I, I run every other day, I do yoga, it's, it's, you know, Mike Patterson, gosh, he's, he looks fantastic. And he, he does, does look every good. day, yeah. which God, you, you have to maintain the machine. Or, yeah. You know. Now, yeah. and the piano is a relatively physical instrument. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, it, you know, you have to do it. Yeah, it's, they're all like that. We're we're all very physical. You really have to take care of yourself. Yeah, you do. Um, Wendell. Uh, oh, by the way, Oscar Hernandez. Oh, senor. He's giving what you a, kudos. What a, what a beautiful, beautiful musician and composer and arranger and a great cat. 
He's he is. I totally agree. I love with his music. Yeah, yeah right. he's wonderful. Yeah. Um, Wendell uh, says, "Ask about pianist writing for pianist Marion Petrucci." Petrucci. Marion Petrescu. Oh, sorry. Marion Petrescu probably was he's probably the greatest piano player you've not heard of. He uh, he's he's from Romania, but he lives in Finland, and he's the guy that. Um, uh, George Clavin came up with the idea. I mean, he really part of what Marion can do yeah. is really the Oscar Peterson style. He really has got it nailed. And uh, that was really a problem I had early in, in my development. Yeah. I was really into Oscar and I really had to, I had to get away from that because you do have to acquire your own individual voice. Yeah. Um, I had the same thing with Rachmaninoff and, uh, all of that, you know, I, you can't just listen, you can't just be one singer, right? You have to, if you listen to 10 singers that really absorb what they, what they all have to offer, then you will have your own style because you pick and choose the yeah. things you like from each of these. Yeah. So um, uh, rather than I got away from Oscar, um, I got into Wynton Kelly and uh, the unknown genius, Sonny Clark, uh, Monk, of course, Bud Powell, um, and then, of course, Chick, Herbie, Keith, uh, and, you know, that hopefully you can, Kenny Barron, yeah. uh, so many other people, hmm. you can develop your own style if you take some of each. And um, uh, Marion, you know, can play a lot of different ways. And he, he's, he's got his own thing now, but he, he has this brilliant ability to do the Oscar thing. So George Clavin said, I want to do a, a tribute to Oscar Peterson. Uh and so he and I picked out the music and uh, Marion was the pianist and I arranged this for big band. Oh. And uh, one of the things, you know, I, having worked with Buddy Rich, who not only was a great musician, but a great kind of a uh, salesman for the music, a show person in the, yeah. in the best possible way. He, he, he was a fun, fun guy. And, and when he wasn't yelling at the band, he was really fun to be with. And he, um, uh, he always had this thing at the end of each show uh, and it would be a suite. It would be a 15, 20 minute extravaganza that would end with a big drum solo and it would bring the house down. And one of the things he always did was West Side Story, the great Bill Reddy arrangement that uh, was done for him. And uh, uh, so I suggest to George Claben, well, Oscar did a, a West Side Story. Let me paraphrase that. And George said, oh, that's too long. That's not going to fit. And I'm like, yeah, but let's do, let's do a short version of it, like a medley, like a Buddy Rich type 13, 14 minute medley of, of West Side Story. And George said, okay, I'll, I'll go with that idea. And so I took the Oscar Peterson West Side Story um, record, you know, with Ray Brown and Ed Thigpen and arranged that for big band, and kind of consolidated it down to a 13, 14 minute thing. And Marion played the hell out of it. It was, it was just fantastic. And, uh, uh, that's what won the Grammy in uh, 2011. Oh. 2009, I think. Wow. That that came out well. That's a good record. It's on Resonance Records. Uh, the Resonance, Resonance Big Band plays Oscar Peterson is the name of the record. Wow. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah, I, I, uh, I can't imagine how many pro projects you've done. Probably hundreds. Oh, gee, I don't know. Um, been quite a few. Um, yeah. Uh, in this last year, <laughs> not so many. <laughs> <laughs> I know. You know, I was just, uh, I had, for my business license every year, you know, you have to put in your gross, your your yearly gross and stuff, you know. And I was like, I went through my, my book and I was like, yeah. <laughs> All right. Nothing. Yeah, pretty know. pretty low this year, you know. I don't, I don't really need to have... Uh, I've never really had a business license, so and I know a lot of freelancers will be interested in why you why you have one and what advantages you get from having one. I'd be interested to know about that. Why do I have one? Uh, I think it was, you know, I, it's really interesting. I just keep getting one, but I think it's for teaching. Um, I think oh, some at some point I needed. I don't really remember to tell you the truth. And no one has asked me that. And 
I've had it for a long time. Every year I get it again. I, you know, I'm going to have to, <laughs> I, I'm embarrassed. I don't even remember why I do it anymore. I just well, do well, it. It might have been a really good decision at the time. I know that you do have to show a profit in your business. I, I think you can have a loss, but like after five years, if you don't, you, yeah. gain, it's a hobby unless you're Donald Trump and have a, a good lawyer. Um, it's Deutsche, true. Bank, Deutsche Bank, right? Uh, he defaulted on a, a Deutsche Bank loan in 2008. Yeah. Still giving him money. Wow. Huh. <laughs> wow. That, he's got some good people working on his side. I don't think I can get them. But, um, <laughs> but you're uh, right, though, actually, because I actually, we got um, the IRS, uh, you know, what is that called? Audit. Yeah. Audit. See, simple words like that. I forget these days. But anyway, and then he, the guy tried to say that what I did was a hobby. And um, my tax guy was so good. He was, he, he laughed. He said, no, no. And he said, and here's all the stuff. And the guy, the IRS guy looked at it. He was like, uh, uh, you could see him thinking, oh God, this is such a big workload. And at that time, a Supreme Court judge happened to actually rule for the artist. There was a woman who was an artist and a teacher in a um, in a college, and then she had her art on the side, and she was saying that that was her work. And they were saying I, the IRS was saying no, and uh, the the Supreme Court judge ruled in favor of her. He said, "This is not a hobby. This is her life. This is her yeah, life work." She's making income on it then it's got to be your business yeah well she was taking a loss. she was saying it was a loss so that's why the irs decided it was a hobby but no you do have to show you do have to show profit even if it's small yeah but but you can it's like you can lose money but <clears throat> after five years i believe it becomes a hobby yeah so I think you can lose money for three, four years and, and still be all right. Yeah. As long as you're making something. Yeah. Okay. So Oscar and Michael are yeah, telling me, like as a band leader and producer, it's helpful for taxes. Yeah. Private teaching maybe. Yeah. I, something along those lines or my workshops or, yeah, I can't quite remember why I started it because I've been doing it for at least 10 years. But um I always thought about incorporating because, you know, there are I always, I did too. That. Yeah. But my, uh, my accounts have always said, uh, um, it's a lot of work and you may not save enough money uh, to make it worthwhile. Yeah. But yeah. I heard that. Me, too. I have a, I have a gig during the day. So, and I've, I've been teaching at Cal State Fullerton. Um, uh, You've been there a long time, right? Uh, 14 years. Yeah. I'm oh. Head of jazz study. For oh, uh, that, um, that means I really incorporation is not something I, I really need to do. But when, really uh, before the before COVID, were you driving there to Fullerton all the time? Yep, yeah, yeah. about an hour each way, and then I would, I you know, four days a week. But I would usually stay in a hotel oh. there two days a week. You know, there's yeah. all kinds of cheap hotels down there because of Disneyland. Yeah, yeah. But you know, this year I haven't had to do that, which actually has been one of the silver linings. Yeah, I had to get down there. Yeah, I worked in uh, for uh, about two years, two, two or three years ago, I was teaching at Idlewild. And I'd, I'd have to be up there a few days every week. So I just stay, I had beautiful, you know, they put me up in a beautiful spot. I mean, what's not to be beautiful about Idlewild? And um, but then after the year, I just thought, you know what, this feels so much like being on the road. I just I, I don't want to do it. So I turned it over to my friend. But um, that's a long drive. How, how was it? An hour and a half, maybe. I think it was longer. I can't remember. Maybe it maybe at least two hours. Yeah. 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 And I'm not, I wasn't really going in rush hour. I, I got my schedule. So it was like 11 to seven or eight. Oh, so, cool. you know, it, 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 was, it was never more than an hour, hour 10 at the very worst. Yeah. Um, yeah. But still kind of rough. And uh, yeah, if I if I go back to it, you know, I may. I've got a lot of friends down there I can stay with. So, yeah, um, yeah. So that's sort of like, oh, like being a kid again. Oh, yeah, staying at people's houses. And, <laughs> and with COVID, everything is like, no, staying at people. This whole social distance thing, it's, you know, man, we're in a, we're in a tough spot right now. So 
I'm just uh, keeping my mask on. And I actually have a gig on Sunday hmm. with uh, Derek Olas and Rick Montalbano, uh -huh. um, All Saints Church in Pasadena. Oh, nice. Um, it's over to the public, uh, you know, wow. Zoom. And uh, there's going to be the three of us and two other folks manning the thing, uh, socially distanced. We're going to do a Jazz Vespers at 10 a.m. on Sunday. Um, How nice. Sunday, 10 a.m., ladies and gentlemen, Pacific time. We're going to play uh, Christmas music. I, I got to figure out what we're going to do. Are you um, putting that on your uh, your website or how do people reach that? Um, you know, <laughs> right now I have to say I'm in the middle of a website chaos. So oh. uh, I'm having a hard time getting on and getting my gigs done and my webmaster is AWOL and I'm trying to get <laughs> the website going and all of those all Brooklyn. It's all crazy, but uh, uh, I'll, I'll be putting it up on Facebook and um, I'll okay. come, you know. And it's probably on their site. Yeah. All Saints Church. Pastor. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds great. I want to hear that. That's beautiful. I, I actually did a gig last week um, at the LA Athletics Club. And, you know, he had he had set up a Thursday night gig for six years or something. And then um, this the bass player and um, Dave Ross. And so oh, he I know Dave. I played with him. <laughs> I played with him on the beach. And oh yeah he's got a house on the beach and so i, I had like my electric piano and sand and, and the waves and it's and nice I, yeah yeah they had great food and drink yep. it was really fun yeah i did that gig too that was really fun well he's he's a very creative person so he's he's actually started the an la athletics club gig on thursday nights to um and people like you and i we can we can have our band and you know the money is dependent on people buying tickets and um but anyway that was like a week or two ago and i had i was with atmaro and carrie frank on b3 and out on separate on drums and i god i had so much fun it felt so good <laughs> yeah. yeah it's a great band yeah great band and just feels so good to play well with a good band but you know <laughs> just feels so good you know to make music oh god you know i, I did a gig uh, a few weeks ago uh, i won't even say where it was and you know it was just great to get out it's just great to get out you know i'm, I'm really only playing gigs where you can play outside uh, yeah yeah uh, of course yeah uh, this all saints that's the first indoor gig i've played and i think they're being really really cautious about everything Oh yeah, I'm, I'm sure. I'm actually now with this big COVID spike. Now I'm thinking of not like not going to grocery stores anymore. I'm thinking of doing Instacart and having them ship everything. A, yeah, people are doing that. Yeah, our our daughters are really like push us to do that. Um, I'm I you know some people would shake their heads at me, but I just I don't I don't do crazy things. But I just I go to the market still. No, oh, I, I do too. I do too. Yeah, but I'm trying to. Uh, you're you're not far from me. What's your favorite supermarket now in New York? Well, I either go to Vaughn's or Sprouts usually. Yeah, yeah. Um, I started going to Whole Foods because now uh, Amazon bought them and they're giving you all kinds of rebates and stuff, and their selection is pretty good and a lot of organic. My wife and I only eat organic except when I, you know, sneak off and you know, get a <laughs> taco somewhere. It is nice to to generally eat organic, isn't it? Well, you know, I, I don't know. I, 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 I sort of trust that um, we don't eat a whole lot of meat. We do eat chicken and fish once in a while. Yeah. But, uh, uh, the, and the main reason is for the planet, you know, trying to be good. Yeah. But um, I'm not 100%. I'm, I'm, I, I, and I try not to be a snob, you know. Yeah. Um, but, um, you know. Veggies are good. Trying to get as many. You, the thing is, if you make, you can take something with veggies, as I think you do. If you can make it feel like ice cream in your mouth, you can, you can get away with it. So, okay, my friend Paul Joe said uh, he's he's uh, watching his sugar intake, and uh, he found something. This is not about vegetables, but it's kind of cool to know that um, whipped cream in the can. You know, it has low sugar actually, and and he he sprayed some into a bowl, and then he froze it, and it's just like ice cream. And then he puts fruit with it, and it's great. That's wild. 
Um, I, <laughs> I, um, I had a friend once who would do, you know, a cup of coffee, just put a little whipped cream, uh, whipped cream around the, that, that was really nice. But uh, what I do is I just take the blender, frozen banana, um, celery, kale, spinach, a few blueberries, milk, almond milk. It doesn't matter. Bam. It's, it's, it's fantastic. I have that every couple of days. Yeah, I have almost every day. I have this. This is like, what do I put in it? A banana, uh, carrot juice, um, uh, like some kind of uh, coconut milk or soy milk, and then mangoes. I'm really big on mangoes. Frozen mangoes oh, yeah. are usually in. Frozen mango. Yeah, and then um, you know some other additives like you know so similar to you green stuff and um, yeah, and I do that at least three days a week. And usually, usually four or five, maybe. No, those are really good. Yeah. yeah. I'm also yeah. drinking a lot of coffee. I'm doing like kind of really. Oh, really? The one thing that makes me feel good in the morning. It's, it's yeah. the only drug I really have anymore. Do you know that uh, what's actually good to take away the acidity is a pinch of baking soda in your coffee, and you you don't taste it. Oh, well, that makes sense, right? The uh, yeah. acid uh, base thing. Yeah. Pitch your baking soda. So that'll make it better on your stomach and stuff? Yep. Really? All right. I'm going to try that. Yeah. Because I'm a serious espresso guy. So I have a Gaggia. Uh -huh. uh, I was going to say monophonic, but I mean manual espresso machine. Yeah. And I have a Barazza burr grinder. <laughs> right. I, I have about three of those in the morning. And I know it's too many, but I have to. I have to. <laughs> So I'm going to try the baking soda thing. If that makes it feel better in, in your body, then that's Yeah, it does. Because for, I, for a few weeks ago, like a month ago, I had, I never get, you know, um, upset stomach GERD kind of things. I never get that. Although I do have a chronic cough that I've had for years. And some doctors have said that's what it is. But um, I, I was a little worried just because of the COVID thing, you know, because I was, my stomach really hurt actually. And oh, I went in and he gave me something to drink and he said, do you feel better? And I said, yes. And he said, you know, it's just, uh, whatever GERD, the other word that you use. Yeah. Acid, reflux. Yeah, acid reflux or, yeah, and, yeah. um, I have that too a little bit. Well, maybe, maybe, I don't know about in, you'll have to test it out in espresso. Maybe I, I don't like think you would taste the it. Baking soda thing or yeah. Like just do you taste it or not? But in a cup, regular cup of coffee, I don't taste it. It's just a pinch, you know, cause that's the chemical okay. you know, reaction. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. but you know, <laughs> my kitchen has been being redone since July. So I don't have a kitchen. Oh, Lord. And I, so Gary and I bought a, um, a grill. We know we had never had a grill before. I know, I know. Shocking. But anyway, what kind of grill did you get? Because I'm getting just, ready to buy one. Oh, we just bought the simplest Weber grill, you know, like the gas or uh, charcoal, charcoal That's and, nice. but vegetables on it are, Oh yeah. I mean, anything on it is good. The no, meat veg tastes veg totally veg different. Yeah. <laughs> but vegetables are really wonderful on it. Yeah, I went on Consumer Reports. I'm looking at grills, and there's like this thing called a, uh, you know, you can get, you can get gas, you can get charcoal, you can yeah. get pellets. Yeah, the pellets are kind of cool because they're reconstituted wood, so you get a little bit of that wood thing, huh. that, that that taste in your food. That, yeah, that kind of good. but you know, I'm uh, cooking outside is, is awesome, and we can do that. It's it's fun. It took us a long time <laughs> to. I shouldn't admit this, but really, my I mean, my husband and I are relatively smart. But it took us a really long time to understand how to light the briquettes. I mean, you know, there were it, there was information and stuff, but yeah, well, that takes a while. I I, I think I'm, I'm either going to be a gas guy or a pellet guy because yeah. those, those are easier to deal with in terms of lighting. But charcoal tastes the best, though. That's really, uh, you know. Yeah. I don't know if pellets are easy to light all by themselves, but they if are. if you, Tornado. they are? There's a, the pellet uh, grills have uh, electronic ignition. Oh, all right. Okay. Good. You don't, then you don't need I, that. I'm lazy. I'm off with the switch. I don't, my fireplace is the same way. It's gas. I go, 
it's on. I, I'm not doing good work. I don't, I don't want to do it. <laughs> yeah. But uh, so what like was? Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Right. No, no, you go ahead. No, I was just going to ask. Um, you know, Bob Moses said something really interesting. He doesn't. He doesn't listen to music all the time. He listens. He has silence a lot, and oh. he, he he. I mean, obviously, he likes that. And he he said if he likes something that he hears, he doesn't listen to it again and again and again. I tend to listen to it again and again and again to soak it in, and he doesn't mm -hmm. do that. He he feels like it influences him too much. That's interesting. Yeah, um, I have I have this weird feeling about that. Like, you know, the Sibelius Fifth Symphony. Have you ever heard that piece? No. All right. Well, it's it's this absolutely gorgeous piece of music, but then it gets, hey, Kathy, can I share the screen? I want to play you the finale of this thing. It's a really weird. You can. You should be able to just share it. Can I share it? Let me see. I just want to. It, it, it's got this theme that you've seen in movies like Braveheart, you know. just this beautiful beautiful <laughs> finish you see the mountains and the air and the trees and everything and it goes on and near the end of it it goes on and on and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and the strangest bizarrest thing happens and it's kind of it's 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 really really weird and i want to share it with your audience because this is the type of piece i can't listen to it more than about once a month or every couple of months and i can't listen to this one section because if i do it'll you'll lose the essence and the brilliance and the gorgeousness of it so uh let's see all right here we go last movement so this is just so bizarre and so wonderful uh swedish esapeka yeah this is good Oh, I'm sorry. I forgot that when you do, uh, you have to enable the screen. You have to go in and share the screen and share the sound. Right. Oh, so it looks good. There we go. Then I go back here and here we go. How is that? Can you hear that? Does that sound good? Yeah. Gonna play like the first two minutes of it and I'm gonna skip to the end. It is the strangest ending. Huh. It's absolutely the thing you wouldn't expect. I'm a big fan of his. He's a great conductor and he's, he's composing it really. You look so young. He's quite young. The Braveheart theme comes in about a million. Really well. Beautiful. Okay, so you get that. So he develops this theme, some other things happen, and then to cut to the chase.
that's it. <laughs> How bizarre and wonderful that is. Wow. Yeah. Um, now, I'm sorry, who, would you repeat who that is? That's a Pekasalanen and... What, what, what? Oh, the Sibelius Symphony Number no. 5. Okay. Yeah. And who, and who, did he write that? Uh, uh, Jan Sibelius. Uh, he's a Finnish composer. He was actually Swedish origin, but he's a Finnish composer. He wrote, um, his biggest hit that people know is called Finlandia. Oh, I've heard of that. Oh, oh, whoops, let me get rid of this thing. I need to quit this and get out of... Uh, I don't want it to uh, impact our... Okay, I think it's gone. Um, yeah, he wrote a thing called Finlandia. Um, it's like a hymn kids sing at school. like a 10 minute orchestral thing but based oh, on beautiful that. beautiful he's, he's a great guy. he's a guy i really enjoy he's got a beautiful violin concerto and seven symphonies all which are really nice um and i love in that you know it sounds basically almost really hollywoody in some ways but then he'll put a zinger in there so he's like He'll throw argh, monkey wrench right in there. Really, <laughs> I, I love I love when music does that. It really makes me feel something, and I can't listen to it very often because it, you know it, it it gives it away. And and I won't listen to just the end. I make myself listen to the whole thing, so I get the stunning, shocking effect of what happens at the end. Yeah, I, I'm curious, and I'm sure other people are curious too. Um, I mean. Uh, I'm just curious, how did you get to be so familiar with all of this music? Because it seems like you have, of course, you're playing what you know, but still you have an end, it's kind of an endless supply of pretty uh, complicated music. I mean, do you still study, study a piece and learn it? Or is this just over the years that you've... Over the years, yeah. I was lucky, my parents exposed me to classical music at a very young age. Huh. I mean, I heard Ravel's Bolero from the age of two. I, mean, I can play you the whole thing all the way through. Oh, wow. There's something about learning something when you're young, you know. Um, yeah. I, I think I was really, I think I, I got to really reflect on how lucky I was to have a parental environment. Um, and, you know, where I was really exposed to that at a very young age. And actually, I was a classical music major. I was kind of a second rate classical piano player all the way through um, at um, Duke, uh, which wasn't really much for music department, but I, I wasn't good enough to get into a good department. So I just went there because I liked Duke and uh, I was a psych major initially. Oh. Uh, but um, I, I really, I didn't even get into the jazz department at Eastman. I was, I, I didn't really, I had to, I was, my background in jazz wasn't sufficient. So I had to really study for a year before I could get in. Yeah, but yeah, I'm I've, I've good. I've, I just was exposed to it from a very young age, but I listen to it all the time. I mean, I listen to jazz, too, but probably I'm listening 70, 60, 60, 70 percent to classical music and 40 percent to jazz, maybe. Yeah. OK, just wondering. I, you know, I wasn't brought up at all on classical at all, and I didn't really I didn't I I'm very unknowledgeable about composers and the music and um yeah i just mostly was jazz and of course you know growing up through the pop era and you know how did you get into jazz though who, who are you listening to my dad was a sax player and, he, and a band leader and he was totally into i mean he was kind of straight straight but he liked uh, like stan kenton and 
he had Ella Records and, uh, you know, Rosemary Clooney, you know, kind of a little more more straight down the middle. And then my sisters were four years old or so as I was growing up and one played piano and then we we were singing the music that came out on sheet music then, but that included Joe Beam and, you know, all the, the great American songbook things. But I just was very, I was really intrigued with jazz and also... I must admit, like I've I've said on this before, when I was, you know, like four and five, my dad would bring me to rehearsals and the band would flirt with me. And of course, I liked that. So I thought, sure. yeah, I like this. <laughs> so that was, uh, but my dad and I, my sisters were incredibly musical, but they were more my mom's, you know, girls and I was more my dad's. So I, my dad, you know, that the jazz was so much what I liked from as early as I can remember. And I I went to Berkeley too, but, and so I was at, in Boston and at Berkeley in the early seventies. And that was a really great time for music, right? And not only jazz, all kinds of Motown and uh, Woodstock stuff and blues, because Boston was real into blues then, right? Mm-hmm. But that was like when ECM was really coming up and Weather Report and, you know, um, so the music and, and John Schofield and, oh, and there was so yeah. much of a mix there, right, at that time? Yeah. And I, I, you know, what we said before was the pop music of the age, jazz and, and, and pop music on the radio, you would, you would, it, they actually connected. I mean, you yeah. would hear... You know, you had Dave Brubeck on the radio in the 60s. And then after that, Vince Guaraldi, I heard that yeah. on the radio. And then uh, moving forward, um, the Jobim music, mm-hmm. uh, Sergio Mendez. Yeah. Um, hey, and Herb Alpert. And uh, yeah. I, I loved that. I thought it was fantastic. Yeah, that was I, really I had a band fun. where we, we did a Herb Alpert's music when I was in grade school. <laughs> Wow. We, were called, we were called the Lonely Bulls. Ah, <laughs> Mara wanted to know if you developed perfect pitch as since you were young. I was lucky; I always had it. Oh, I always had it. It's just, uh, you know, I I've known some really really awesome musicians who didn't have it. Yeah, and they actually had some advantages because, like. When I was trying to learn how to play the clarinet, yeah. I had to transpose just to do it because every note sounds wrong, <laughs> right? You play a C on the clarinet and it's a B flat. I'm like, I can't, I can't make this. <laughs> it it kind of bugged me. But uh, that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah, I think it's more of an advantage than a disadvantage. I mean, like once in a while, if I doze off on the bandstand, I forget where I am. I can hear a bass note and it kind of helps me get back on track a little quicker. <laughs> you never doze off. <laughs> well, I, I swear, I, I saw Kenny Barron one time, and he, 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 I mean, I never heard him, I never heard him make a mistake, really, but he would always have the cognac on, on, on the piano. <laughs> and, and Terrell Stafford and I used to joke, you know, you'd see, you'd see Kenny play all this. He would pop up like he was falling asleep. <laughs> I've never had a chance to ask whether he actually fell asleep or not. But no, you know, once in a while on the bandstand, your attention wavers a little, or you think about something else, or you think about what the next tune is. Yeah. You forget where you are in the form. I mean, you know, yeah, yeah. It's human nature. Yeah, yeah. And if if perfect pitch will will help you get back. Yeah. Because I can I can hear where I where I am a little quicker. Yeah. But I try well, not to rely on it. um uh, pat kelly said perfect pitch must make you love us guitar players you know what it doesn't it doesn't (laughs) bother me i am no more discerning a pitch than uh, than anybody else i can't really um it doesn't hurt you no no in fact i don't think no i'm i'm no better at that than anybody else yeah i can i can hear I can enjoy out of tune music as well as the next person. <laughs> That's nice. <laughs> um, Bill, it's been two hours. Kathy, it flew by. <laughs> it's it been so by. much fun to talk to you. I loved it. Thank you so much for asking me. Did you want to say anything to the broad general public? 
Oh, gee whiz. I just, um, I just want everybody, I just hope people have a great week this week. Do something fun. Um, be with people. You know, people are the one thing that we need to be happy besides the music. And we don't have them as much right now. And it's, I, it's, it's a drag. But we all have to remember that if we have somewhere nice to live and something to do that we like to do, we're better off than most people. So we just have to count our blessings and try to see the silver linings and hope that we get that vaccine and, you know, get, get that in the people's arms so that maybe by summer we'll be swinging again. You know, this morning I had a drive by of uh, my dot, my daughter, my stepdaughter and my two grandchildren, my granddaughters who are four and eight, and uh, they sang happy, Merry Christmas to us. Oh, well, <laughs> it was great. really fun. Yeah. Really, really great. We went out in our pajamas and <laughs> it was great. Oh, they're yeah. so cute. Uh, you know, I never had kids, but the grandchildren, I, I now I'm now I understand the love that you feel for children. And uh, I mean, you know, your own children. And I just I'm constantly amazed every time I see them. I really like them. I think I like I like the people they are. These little kids, you know. Well, you're you're, you're very fortunate. That's that's a really great thing. Yeah, you know, yeah. Well, we we just got two cats. We got two kittens. Oh. Rescues. Oh. Um, guy was kind of went zingo and he had to get rid of them. Yeah. So we took them and evidently there's there's a there's not much of a market for cats seven six to seven months old. People want little 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 kitties, right? Yeah. So these guys are like they're toilet trained, they're well behaved. Yeah. Um, you know, they're awesome. And yeah. um, there's a psychotherapist named uh, I think his name is John Kelly. Uh, although I'm thinking about John Kelly chocolates because I'm going to get them for my wife because it's her anniversary, <laughs> our anniversary. But uh, no, John Kelly, he says that the, the feline mystique, people are supposed to be more like cats. We would be, if we were more like cats, we'd be happier because cats are never bored. They, they don't <laughs> worry about having anything to do. They, just, <laughs> they sleep when they want to, they eat when they want to. We should all be more like cats. And then the lady in the New York Times said, yeah, except if you're a mouse. <laughs> Not so good to be a mouse. If you're a That's funny. Yeah. Well, oh, hi, Roger Berg. He says hello from Sweden. Oh, uh, cool. Hi, Roger. And Tim Weston says hi. Oh, Tim Weston, one of my favorite people. We we engaged in some witty Facebook. He Oh, he did a great Facebook Someone, uh, someone said, uh, rightfully so. Are you sick and tired of people like, you know, people are, you know, someone's telling people what they're doing and in the same email thread, people are self-promoting. <laughs> and Tim emails back and says, yeah, I have a cassette. Can I, it's really nice. Can I send it to you? <laughs> so hi, Tim. You're a funny guy. Tim, I always, I, I always. I, t I always, except I, I was doing that towards the earlier part of the series, but I always talk about his recording uh, that was a tribute to Rodgers and Hammerstein. Yeah. Oh, that recording just killed me, especially like, you know, I have my favorite cuts, like Nan Schwartz's arrangement for Mark Murphy of um, this only was... This only was mine. Is that the? Da, 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 da. Oh God! It just uh, gorgeous. You rip your heart out of your body. That's amazing. yeah, yeah, really beautiful. Thanks a lot, Kathy. I love talking to you. Thank you, Bill. Thank, Thank you. You too. Okay. Merry yeah. Christmas to everybody. Okay. We'll see you. Bye bye. bye. And ladies and gentlemen, uh, Monday, um, I have on one of my favorite modern jazz singers who is a sweetheart of England, Norma Winstone. And if you're into Jay Clayton, Sheila Jordan, uh, Nancy King, Norma Winstone. And uh, then uh, Tuesday, the 29th, Greg Ab Abate, uh, sax player, and Frank Griffith, Wednesday from England, sax player. And uh, I'm just going to keep going. I, just, I even have Flora Purim coming in in February. So... Uh, I hope you have a great holiday week. 
I'm really looking forward to a, a great holiday week. And I have a lot of free time and I'm going to I'm going to get on my projects, maybe a little re relaxation too. So hi, Frank. Yeah, next Wednesday, it's going to be really fun. Oh, you're going to play a brief tribute to the late Johnny Mandel. Cool. I like that. All right, everybody. Bye-bye. Take care.